Hello, and thank you for tuning in today. Today I have something really special for you guys. I am interviewing Mr. Jeff Hutchinson and his wife Rebecca. I met Jeff when I was working part-time at a kite store, Kites Unlimited, here on the island. Jeff is the GM of the kite store, and I can't stress how lucky I feel to have been able to meet him. And I just completely respect everything he stands for and him and his wife's story and journey through life. So I was really excited to share this with you guys, and I hope you enjoy it. I think you'll find their story really fascinating. And uh, without further ado, here's the interview. All right, so I'm here with some very special guests today, Mr. and Mrs. Hutchinson. You guys want to give a brief background on who you are? You can go ahead and start. Um, I grew up in West Columbia, which is uh, about 45 miles from here. I was born in Port Lavaca, Texas. Uh, I had two siblings. Um, my parents were in the community newspaper business. My dad started a paper in Port Lavaca where I was born and then we moved to West Columbia and he started a paper there. Um, went to high school there, graduated, kind of went to college, not really. I went to the beach more than I went to college and <laughs> ended up dropping out. Um, eventually went to work for my parents in the newspaper business. Um, stayed there um, for 30 years, met Jeff in the same small town, and we uh, have four kids. All right. That's Rebecca, <laughs> and I'm Jeffrey, or Jeff, or she's Becky. Uh, born in California in San Bernardino, moved to Colorado and lived my younger life there, and for some strange reason, lived in Kansas for a few years till the seventh grade, and I moved to College Station, Texas, where my father's a professor. He taught architecture, and went to high school there in College Station, graduated, went to A&M for a couple of years, uh, I did spend my freshman year though at Sam Houston, but then transferred back to A&M. Noticed there wasn't too many girls on campus and I was bored and I went to Southwest Texas State in San Marcos and I graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts. I ran a, the, the university park there in town at Sewell Park, which was the greatest job anybody could possibly ever have. Uh, people and girls in bikinis, guys and swimsuits and swimming and hacky sack and frisbee and volleyball all day long. But it was interesting, I painted a mural on this recreation center and then they hired me to work there. Then they hired me to be the park manager all from painting this big mural um, of the outdoors in the hill country in their little tent shop. After that I graduated, lived in Austin for about three years, worked for some ad agencies there uh, doing architectural drawings uh, and that's what I studied at A&M was architecture and then got a job working for uh, the city of Austin in their rec center and I ran an art gallery and then a job came up in West Columbia at a place called Varner Hall Plantation State Historic Site they needed a new manager and in 87 they hired me about six months later I met Becky about a year and a half later, we got married, and we got Mikey, Nina, Annabelle, and Lillian as our kids, and a couple outlaws came to live with us too, uh, good ones though, <laughs> and Naomi, and even our niece and nephew, uh, Alexandra, and Alexandra came and lived with us. Uh, worked there at the new, I mean, worked there at the state park for 15 years, and then I went to the George Ranch for about six months and worked there with the Fort Bend Museum. And then Becky offered me to work the newspaper and I just put it all in there. She was running the business and all the house and I was kind of gone a lot. So I worked the newspaper 15 years and then um, we decided after the kids had graduated college, uh, they were kind of getting on their own and we had nobody at the house. Uh, our mother, my mother came to live with us for a period of time and then she moved back to her hometown in Tech, uh, Kansas and then uh, we decided to move to Durango, Colorado and that's where we wrote the book, I Am Mother Earth and got it published and uh, after a couple of years of being there and our newspaper was still in, we 
West Columbia and operating, but it was starting to fall, kind of flounder a bit. We came back to try to take care of things. We ended up closing it down. Then we looked at each other and said, we wanna, what do you want to do now? I said, how about live in Galveston? So uh, lucky enough, we found this house. And then uh, right at the same time, I got hired as the general manager at Kites Unlimited. And now we're living a Galvestonian life. <laughs> There you go. Well, so I want to ask you a question first about you moved around a lot, like you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, what experiences in those states had the greatest impact on the person you became? Uh, my mother will tell you that it's that you constantly have to reprove yourself. Every time you move somewhere, you have to reprove yourself. And she would say that that probably made me stronger. I probably would have rather have lived in one certain area and grown up kind of like Becky did in West Columbia and you don't have to constantly reinvent yourself all mm -hmm. the time. But yeah, I think I counted 27 homes I lived in before we moved here. And, uh, and so I think adapting and rechanging and retooling your life over and over and over again probably was the, the biggest. Okay. I can relate to that a little bit myself. I've been a pinball around Texas, yeah. born I in Odessa. Really nature probably has influenced our lives more than anything. Mm -hmm. Everywhere we have gone, you know, we love the Texas coast. We love the water. We love the sand. We love the smell of the salt. Mm -hmm. uh, then we went to the mountains, and we love the river and the mountains and the fall aspen leaves right. and all that stuff. Uh, we loved hiking. It was wonderful to be able to pull up on the side of the road in Colorado and hike wherever you wanted to, you know, do what you wanted. It mm -hmm. was very freeing, and I think nature has probably yeah. navigated us around to our moves. Okay, and that's a good way to transition into this. Tomorrow is Earth Day. It is. So what do you guys plan for doing uh, to do for Earth Day? Well, actually, right after this interview, we're going out to the beach. Okay, you're going to do a cleanup? <laughs> and so we're going to enjoy it out there. Uh, we were out to, actually there last night watching the sunset at San Luis Pass, which we love to do. Um, but I'm going to go back to work. And, <laughs> so <laughs> We would uh, love to, we want to keep promoting our book because it's about Mother Nature and about saving mm -hmm. the earth and... Being earth friendly, eco friendly, less plastic, eat more, less meat. Uh, you know, uh, we are learning every day <laughs> about yeah. things that we shouldn't do, things that we could do, things that we must do. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's okay to not be perfect, I think, but to be aware and to be woke <laughs> <laughs> uh, and realize that we're not going to be here forever and. Yeah, Earth Day is pretty important to yeah. focus on those things. On the leave footprints. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and ones that'll be washed away. So, yeah, we're we're very outdoor oriented everywhere we live, pretty much. And I love the book, by the way, as I've told you, I think, 20 times now. Yeah, yeah. It's but wonderful. we've read it to Journey so many times. He likes the colors. He likes anything it's colorful beautiful. right now artwork it's yeah. gorgeous really good it is art and so we'll, we'll talk about that a little more in a minute too because i want to talk about that book too um but first for you jeff you mentioned your your schooling yes and uh, your parents had a strong background in the fine arts as well yeah. was it difficult for you to decide that that was going to be part of your pathway or did you know you wanted to do that well it, uh, that was the easy way out i've been around art and architecture and interior design. My mother's an interior designer. My dad taught art and architecture. It, actually, it was easy for me to transition. I mean, you, you show me a, a painting, I probably can tell you who painted it. But actually, <laughs> uniquely, I have a baseball and athletic background, but I had a kind of a severe injury in high school where I stopped playing football. But I probably, if I were to do it all over again, I would somehow stay within baseball or sports administration. Uh, but I probably wouldn't have met you. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm glad it worked out that way. Um, but uh, they had a strong influence in my, my schooling, but I think it was the easy way out because I kind of knew it. I understood that. But I'm also a fanatic about baseball. 
So. What's your favorite team? Oh, the Astros. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Did Did you have any ties to Houston before you came down here that made you an Astro fan, or? No, well, growing up as a kid in Denver, Colorado, was they had a minor league team called the Bears. I followed them a little bit, and then when I lived in Kansas, everybody was a big Kansas City Royal fan. Uh, I kind of always liked Cincinnati and St. Louis as a kid kind of growing up, but once you move here, you kind of fall into it. You know, I, I lived in College Station, so I became a long-haired Aggie <laughs> at that time down in here, but uh, uh, you kind of become a chameleon wherever you kind of go. Mm -hmm. And Asher's been up and down, up and down, so I kind of like watching that in the best, yeah. Do you all know the movie 61? Yes. So I grew up watching that movie all the time. Yeah. And uh, I played baseball since I was three up yeah. until through high school. Uh -huh. um, and I was obsessed with the Yankees, but when I moved to Dallas, I kind of started to become a Ranger fan a little bit, so I yeah. can get that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So while studying in school, you mentioned the mural got you the job as the park manager at Sewell Park, is that right? That's right. Um, did that influence your later career going to Texas Parks and Wildlife? Well, actually, yeah, they when I worked for Parks and Wildlife, they needed the job description required that you had a background in fine arts and recreation and art administration and gallery management all together and I just happen to have every one of those aspects so that's got me into the interview and eventually got me the job. And while working at Texas Parks and Wildlife you met Rebecca right? Yes. So I want to ask you guys how did you meet each other? What was the story? <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell? Um, it was a a festival time for our city. We had an annual festival, the San Jacinto Festival, every year in April. And my mother, uh, who was about 55 at the time, or in her 50s, early 50s, was very active in the community. And um, they had asked her to be on a radio show uh, for KPRC Channel 2 Houston to promote the festival. And it just so happened the new park uh, manager at Warner Hog State Park, they also asked to be on this radio program. So they met at, I don't know, did you drive up together? No, we met there in separate vehicles. At the Channel 2 studios, and they had the interview, and I listened to it on the radio from home. And my mother mentioned to him, as every good mother does <laughs> at some point, I have a daughter, and I think you two would really get along. And she came home and told me, and I was like, oh, please, Mom, because I had not met him. I had no idea who he was. But uh, I still remember the day I met Jeff. I was rolling newspapers. Someone did not show up for their route. And, you know, being the manager <laughs> of the newspaper, it had to get out, and so I was rolling newspapers, and I probably had ink all over me. No, she did. She looked good. And in. he stepped in the door and put his head and said hello, and I was, you had me at hello. There you go. <laughs> Love at first sight, huh? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so did y'all, you said rolling the papers. How many papers did y'all roll on a daily basis? Well, our newspaper distributed 10,000 papers every week, um, but that, you know, that one particular route, they average about 600 papers, but our kids all had paper routes. Oh, okay. And, yeah, we had about 14 different routes. Ooh. Yeah. How, how would you say that that impacted your life working for the newspaper, or own, your family owning the newspaper? Um, it was a, definitely a positive experience. Um, you know, you were right in the thick of things in the community. You published birth announcements, wedding announcements, you death notices. You know, you were always, uh, you know, knew what was going on in the community. And my parents were very well respected. And that, uh, some form of that respect trickled down to Jeff and I when we took over. And, and it's always nice to be known and be appreciated. And, you know, there's 
just with owning any other business, you know, you can't please everybody all the time, but I think I'm very proud of right. how we conducted ourselves and our business, and uh -huh. um, yeah, it was a positive experience. So, among y'all's list of accomplishments, the newspaper, um, your schooling, et cetera, et cetera, you managed to also raise a family of four, like you mentioned, which I'm finding out right now is, I can imagine, pretty difficult for four. <laughs> it's difficult for one. Um, so I'm a young guy, and as of recently a father, I can say I do know one thing is relationships are not easy. If, I could, if you could go back in time to when you were first starting your family, what advice would you give to yourself? Uh, probably be more patient, I think, for me. I mean, you're always in a hurry trying to get through the day, and you got all these kids around you trying to do stuff. Baseball, softball, volleyball, track, uh, dancing, whatever the case may be, and sometimes you hurry through those moments, because now we're 60, and it would be nice to go back to those times when they were having fun, and just to probably relish it, or enjoy it a lot more than trying to get through it too quickly. Makes sense. Yeah. And for you, would you say the same? Uh, patience is a virtue, what they say. <laughs> um, you know, I don't have a lot of regrets. Um, I would say to my younger self, be fearless and be bold. Um, you know, it's scary starting over. We were... Uh, you know, I was 35 years in a community as an adult, uh, and that's all I knew. And if the thought of moving to Colorado and leaving everything we, we knew behind and starting over is really scary, and it's hard. It's, yeah. And especially in today's environment, um, it's hard to find a job. Uh, that makes your confidence level, you know, lag, and you kind of second-guess yourself. Uh, but we are survivors, and we're, Jeff's always the eternal optimist, uh, thank goodness, and that's carried us very far. <laughs> I'm probably a little more determined, you know, full speed ahead, not worry about things, and, uh, but I would say, yeah, be fearless. It's it's not easy. It's life is hard, and relationships are hard. But um, it's worth it. And you know, if you if you love each other, and you'll get through it. We it's shall. Worth it. We shall be bold. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Kids are worth it. They're wonderful. Yeah. So family. It's all about making connections and people. Uh, That's makes the world go round. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so where would you say that optimism comes from, Jeff? Is that just kind of part of who you are? I think being part of a lot of athletic events and programs through my life of, you know, falling down and getting back up and being passionate about something has a lot to do with it. Um, uh, I don't know if I had a particular upbringing, although <laughs> my father's probably the most optimistic person. Being a professor, always trying to teach people to think for themselves and come up with their own ideas. One of his favorite sayings is, uh, I can hardly wait to see what you decide. <laughs> and so it's not on him, his, as a professor, a teacher, to teach people to think for themselves, come up with new ideas that nobody ever thought about before. Uh, and every one of our kids are incredibly optimistic. Most of the time, right? Most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they're... 23, 20, oh, 24, 27, and 29 years old, and Mikey is 30, 38, 38, yeah. Jeez. So, yeah. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> and I think this next one's awesome, too. So I saw y'all's long-standing motto is to preserve and protect natural and cultural resources and support progressive human needs. So I wonder where did that come from, and... How have y'all demonstrated that throughout your lives? Good question. The first part of it, to preserve and conserve, protect natural and cultural resources, is actually part of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Mission. But the human needs thing is kind of where Becky comes in, is that 
uh, very much so in our book about, you know, our human needs need to also balance with nature. And so preserving those resources, human needs, I think, is a combination of kind of our life story of work and also what we've learned and what we see in the world. Okay. So, and that's a good transition to your book, I guess. I think the thing I love the most about your book is that it's, I think it truly captures everything we just talked about, every experience you guys have had. Um, it all kind of comes together in this book. So, I know you've described it to me before, but how would you, to someone watching this who hasn't heard of the book yet, how would you describe it to them? Um, it is a story about adventure and acceptance and good earth stewardship. Um, you know, we have always been uh, so uh, focused on teaching our family to be inclusive and be accepting and to be patient and to be kind. And, uh, you know, all our kids are different. Um, you know, some are outgoing, some are not so outgoing. I don't know. They're all outgoing. What yeah. am I talking about? Yeah. <laughs> um, but we we tried to um, teach them. I mean, it's not perfection that we're looking for. It's just that you keep trying. Um, and, you know, this book came to us in in a terrible moment when I was watching coverage of the Syrian... Uh, refugee crisis. I was just drawn to the television and I really watch a lot of news, probably too much news, but um, the story of those refugees and the children basically is what pulled at my heart. That, you know, I, I would think, how can, what do they dream of? You know, when they go to bed at night, if they have a bed to lay on or a pillow, what, what are their dreams for a beautiful planet? And, you know, that got me to thinking everybody deserves to have a beautiful planet and to have dreams that come true about a beautiful planet. So we started with the story, and uh, it just so happened, a weird thing, uh, uh, serendipitous uh, meeting so. uh, of a, an artist uh, that Jeff encountered through another person. Um, we had the story, and we saw her artwork, Marcella Stormis and Bravo, and I was like, oh my gosh, that, that is my Mother Earth. That's what I envision her to look like. And so he pursued a relationship uh, with her over the Internet, yeah. and we hit it off. We've never met, it, met each other, and uh, she's very eco-conscious and lives in Patagonia and loves nature, and I, I know we would get along swimmingly, it'd be wonderful to meet her, and I hope we do one day. Yeah. But um, I think our purposes came together at the perfect time, and yeah, we made it happen. <laughs> Meeting her was an interesting thing. At one time, and I always fantasize about traveling like everybody else does, but I thought about hiking the Continental Divide. And I was looking at stories about people hiking the Continental Divide. And I ran across these two young ladies who were uh, your age, hiking from Patagonia to South America, all, I mean, down Terra del Fuego, all the way down the tip, and they're going to hike all the way to Canada, through Central America, South America, Central America, into Americas, straight up north. And they were in a village in Chile, and they were taking pictures and doing stories about local people in this little village. This artist uh, that we selected uh, was there, and they took pictures of some of her artwork. And that front page is her artwork that we first one we saw. That's when Becky went, "Wow, that's it!" <laughs> and uh, I connected with her. She spoke fluent Spanish, no English, and so I don't speak any Spanish. So I translated with Google, which is great to have. <laughs> and we communicated, and they, she said she'd do our artwork. It was really cool. It's we still are very good friends on Facebook and you know Instagram and 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we still follow the two young ladies. They made it up to somewhere in Mexico or beyond. I'm not sure exactly where they're at right now. But they've become very popular and they fly back and forth from where they stop back to America to do speeches and programs at universities. And so they've kind of grown from a beginning of, I think I was number six friend on their list and now they have thousands of people. And her, uh, our <laughs> artist, Marcella, has gotten other contracts to do it, uh, projects and we wonder if we helped her along the way too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for people watching, where can they purchase your book? We're on Amazon. You can just look us up. Uh, type in I am Mother Earth Jeffrey Hutchinson and it'll come up and you can order uh, a paperback copy or we also have uh, digital versions available too. There's a couple of stores here in Texas that carry the book um, and you can go on our Facebook page and order it from there too. Okay. Well, awesome. And uh, one last thing little fun question at the end yeah. uh tell me two funny truths about yourselves and one funny lie and see if i can guess the lie <laughs> a funny truth and a fake truth huh okay go ahead um <laughs> skating in Kansas with my friends and we we were skating down this creek which had frozen over and I got to a part and the ice was really thin and I crashed through and I was starting to be pulled up underneath the ice but I kept grabbing the top of the ice and breaking it all the way to the shoreline screaming mama 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 <laughs> all the way there and uh my friends pulled me out and said, uh, you sounded like a little, tiny little kid baby. So that's, that was kind of the, to me, it was, it was actually hilarious. We laughed really loud. I think you missed his point. I, think, <laughs> I thought it was something funny. You're supposed to say three things. Two of them are true and one of them is fake. We did get a funny story out of it, though. <laughs> we did get a funny story. <laughs> Well, that was a fake story. <laughs> was that really a fake one? Yeah, that didn't happen. Oh, wow. You got me there. You had the details and everything. I'm a storyteller. <laughs> are, you, are you looking at a story or are you looking at a word or just a phrase? Uh, it could be like a phrase or something short. It could be a story either or. You definitely could have fooled me with that one. That was pretty detailed. That was fake. That was fake. That never <laughs> happened. <laughs> okay, kind I'll, I'll give you three things. Um, let's see. Uh, I have hiked the Grand Canyon. I have uh, dined with President... George Bush, and I have won money on a show called Dialing for Dollars on television. Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one to guess. I want to say number two is the lie. No. Nope. No, that's the truth? <laughs> I haven't hiked the Grand Canyon. Oh, that would, that would have been my last <laughs> guess on that list. I can't tell a lie. <laughs> We've had a great life, um, and if I were to die tomorrow, I would be. I'm not, you know, I don't want to die tomorrow, but I've done all the things that I wanted to do, which is, you know, have a family, have a career, um, a little bit of adventure, you know. Um, so. I'm very satisfied, but I, I know there's wonderful things out there to come, so, yeah.
I would encourage people to be, uh, to not, to get out of your comfort zone. And, you know, these last few years that we've been traveling around have been stressful to say the least. You know, you have, for a while there, we had no home, no job, no income. <laughs> we were, you know, just living off our savings, um, moving around from place to place, from Airbnb to, you know, family members, and uh, it was stressful, but um, it was worth it. You know, we always laugh and say about the quote from the movie, Mother of the Bride, where the grandmother says, I like the roller coaster. It goes up and down, and it's like life. And you know, I, I like the roller coaster ride too. <laughs> yeah, we do. You're never given a wish without being given the opportunity to make it come true. But you have to work for it. It's nothing that I've seen yet is just absolutely given. I haven't seen too much things that are free. Um, but. Uh, the other thing is, be part of, I think Becky was saying this, is if you don't get out there and do it, you never have the opportunity to achieve it. Um, like fishing, you're never going to catch a fish unless you're actually in the water, trying to catch one. And so, uh, mm -hmm. I kind of go by that. Be kind. Be super mm -hmm. kind. Inspire someone else. Uh, also, about family, is that you always think you have a purpose in life to be something great, right? Uh, be a state representative, president of the United States, a doctor, whatever. It, it really is simpler than that. You're finding this out right now with a young child. Maybe your purpose is just to put together a family. Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking that you, you have to be all these great, wonderful things. You know, being that parent is a great, wonderful thing. And if everybody does that, you've done your part. So uh, I think there was always something in my mind that there was something grandiose life I had to have. Actually, it was right there in front of me. I didn't even know it. So enjoy that. And that part hits deep to me right now. Yeah. Because as you said, I am going through that or maybe have already gone through that and come to accept it. Yeah. Um, but for example, for me, I was hit by a car when I was a kid and mm -hmm went through ICU, wasn't supposed to live, wasn't supposed to wake up if I did live. Wow. Um, wow. So my whole life I heard things like, oh, you're supposed to do great things because you lived, you're here for a reason. And so I kind of put that pressure on myself to, yeah. to try to do big things. And then you start to realize as soon as, honestly, as soon as I saw Journey, I kind of, I realized right then and there, this is, there's no bigger purpose than there this. There is no bigger purpose. person or yeah your influence is forever mm -hmm. <laughs> well I think that's a good place to to wrap this up I think a lot of people if they see this if a lot of people see it maybe two people maybe 20 people who knows yeah. but I think you guys have a really great story and thank you for sharing it with me today you're welcome you can only reach one person <laughs> <laughs> they pay it forward to the next person exactly there we go and then we're all okay right and anyways if you do see this check out this book i am mother earth and i'll put the links in the video for it all right bye y'all thank you hello and thank you for watching today did you know if you like what you see you can actually see full-length vlogs deleted scenes, behind the scenes, and you can even have a say in what Localia does next. You can do this at patreon.com backslash Localia. I'll put that in the description below. If you believe in connections, community, and culture like I do, I really hope you'll join me on this mission. Let's see where we can take this. We will post videos every Sunday at 8 p.m., and I'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you for joining.